Hello, and welcome to part two on our learning series on the scientific revolution here on Learning the Social Sciences. In our last episode, we discussed how the scientific revolution came about. And we also discussed heliocentric and geocentric theory. Now, heliocentric theory is a sun-centered universe, and geocentric is supporting an earth-centered universe. And we also discussed Copernicus and his contribution to just kind of lobbing it out there that it probably is heliocentric or sun-centered universe. Uh, however, we have a lot of people that then are going to be seeking to prove one or the other. They, but you need a few more things to be able to prove the theory. One, we need better observations. And two, we need some math to go and figure it out. An individual that was focused on proving geocentric theory was Tycho Brahe. He is a brash and rude aristocrat. Uh, who lost part of his nose. Well, he lost his nose in a drunken duel at the age of 19. Um, however, he is also a very good astronomer. Now, at the age of two, this man is kidnapped. Well, now a child was kidnapped by his aunt and uncle. And ev eventually his parents relented and let the aunt and uncle raise him, which is not really something you would ever hear of. Um, however, his aunt and uncle ensured that he had a very well-rounded education and in the hopes that he would become a great lawyer. And while he was studying law, he slowly lost interest. One day he saw an eclipse and that just captured him. And then his heart and mind lay with the stars after that. Tycho went and uh, studied in Copenhagen and also in Germany. And when he was 21 years old in Augsburg, Germany, he figured out how to actually build astronomical instruments, allowing him to make accurate observations for the time period. And that is then when he started to really note his observations, to go and record the movement of comets and other items of the night sky. With his work, the King of Denmark eventually gives him a island and he sets an, sets up an observatory on it and is even able to make more accurate data tables. He also hires an assistant, Johannes Kepler, who is going to be making a name for himself too during the scientific revolution. Now, Tycho um, unfortunately dies unexpectedly when he was attending a banquet in Prague. Uh, people don't necessarily know 100% what happened to him, but they assume that he was drinking heavily, but he didn't want to leave the room or the table to urinate because it was improper. Um, and this caused his bladder to burst and his kidney, kidneys to fail, and he died. Uh, after his de death, though, Kepler... Uh, finished up and published his work on the data tables that they had been working on. And those data tables for the time period were quite remarkable. Also, the fact that Tycho Brahe was doing his work with the naked eye. We don't have Galileo's telescope yet. So all of the work that he did and the accuracy of it is quite amazing. And thanks to Johannes Kepler, we have that information because he finished the job of Brahe. But it is also Kepler who is going to put a really big glitch in Brahe's hope that it would be a geocentric universe. Kepler figured out that planets move in ellipses, in an elliptical manner, in an oval-esque shape, not in perfect circles. And so with that, he was able to figure out the mathematical formula for planetary motion. This is going to be one of the major pieces that is eventually going to go and help heliocentric theory. So the time for a planet to travel around the sun is related to how far it is from the sun. And now he could go and do the math to help prove that. Uh, so he goes and publishes his work in the book New Astronomy in 1609, and that is going to then highly influence our next individual, Galileo Galilei. Galileo is an Italian mathematician and natural philosopher. He is a little bit like Brahe in terms of being maybe a little rude to you in conversation. 
Uh, but he is definitely a great scientist. He's also an early practitioner of the experimental method, which used controlled observations and measurements to test hypotheses. He is able to break ground by using a telescope and found the universe to be far more complex than previously understood. And he becomes a high profile heliocentric theory advocate. Now, this is going to maybe have him run into some problems. Um, now, he articulated the concept of a universe governed by mathematical laws, building upon the work of Johannes Kepler. And for him, he also said that there's mathematical formulas for acceleration of falling objects. In other words, there's the law of inertia. And he also went and challenged categories of form and matter. But the big thing for him is that telescope that he went and invented. He saw mountains and craters on the moon. Uh, he went and saw the moons around Jupiter and named them after members of the Medici family. Um, and he also had the concept that perhaps the sun could also be an independent orbital system around a larger system. And he went and knew kind of the complexities of his time period. And so he also brought in arguments to help people that may be supporting geocentric theory based off of the Bible. He brought in arguments for why the Bible would support a heliocentric theory, much almost like Co Copernicus did. However, Galileo is going to have a mistake happen. He is going to insult the Pope. And that's just never good. So he goes and writes a book uh, where it's just kind of a dialogue between two people. Um, however, one person in the book is called Simpleton. Uh, it's in Latin, but he's, you know, the translation is Simpleton. Um, however, uh, based off of a conversation that uh, he had with the Pope, um, when the Pope reads it and anybody else that was close to it, they realized, um, wow the character simpleton was the pope now that can get you in trouble with the church and so galileo is put on an inquisition trial after that book now this is something that is really unique because the church was on and off again a patron of him the medici family on and off patrons he's had different patrons um his daughter is a very devout nun um but they put him on trial for his writings and they condemn him um, eventually, though, uh, Galileo is going to recant uh, and he is going to spend the rest of his life on house arrest. So he goes and recants his work on heliocentric theory. Uh, however, he probably would not have been put on trial for his works and for advocating the Copernican theory if he wouldn't have called the Pope a simpleton. So it's all how you write it down. Sometimes you just got to be a little kinder with your actions um, or maybe think of a different name. Either way, the Galileo trial is big in terms of where science is now going to have its big achievements. Leadership in science is going to move to England, France, and the Netherlands because people don't want to run the risk of being put on an Inquisition trial. Yeah, they can sit there and go like, well, Galileo screwed up in his method of going and talking about heliocentric theory. He shouldn't have done what he did. Uh, he should have gone about it in a different manner. Um, however, people also realize that at any time, if you propose something that might be contrary to the Catholic Church, that they could put you on an Inquisition trial. Now, remember, they have the Spanish Inquisition as a very big model of what can happen to you. And so with Galileo's arrest, the movement goes to the north. And we then have our next individual, E. Francis Bacon, who is known as the father of the scientific revolution. Why? Because he pushes for the scientific method like nothing else. He has this emphasis on practical, useful knowledge. And he brings about this new attitude towards nature. He is also somebody who is highly gifted and talented in numerous fields. He's an English lawyer, government official, historian, SAS, and possibly a playwright. 
Um, he is also known as the father of uh, empiricism uh, or scientific experimentation. So the real accomplishment was setting an intellectual tone conducive to scientific inquiry. He attacks scholastic adherences to intellectual authorities of the past. And he is one of the first European writers to champion innovation and change as goals contributing to human improvement. He is also somebody that was following the method, made sure that everybody can replicate what he has done, including just going out and watching the process of uh, chicken freeze and then thawing for, you know, eating later. Um, going out and just having kind of what we would say would be a simple experiment, but going out and conducting that um, and documenting all of your observations and seeing if your hypothesis worked. So Francis Bacon is the father of the scientific revolution for really stating, let's follow the scientific method from here on out. All right, that was part two on our lecture series on the scientific revolution. Thank you for watching. Have a great day and always remember to like and subscribe. Bye-bye.